Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we're going to be visiting with Allie Fender with Flying F Ranch. So we are going to be talking about how her and her husband, Bryce, got started with their operation. They're on a smaller scale, which is unique compared to most of the people I have on here to visit. I feel like most of the people we visit with are maybe a little larger scale or industry professionals. So this is a unique conversation where Ali talks about how they got started um, just in general, along with how they've diversified with their direct-to-consumer beef business to stay afloat. And she also really talks about, you know, how you can kind of leverage yourself as a smaller producer, which is really something I want all of you to reflect on as you listen today is how can you leverage yourself to be more profitable with where you're currently at and take advantage of your current size. So with that, before we dive into the conversation with Allie, I just want to remind you that if you are looking for a speaker for the rest of 2024 or into 2025, I am booking, whether that's keynotes, panels, workshops, or even Zoom speaking. I'd love to be at your next event and connect with your audience. If you want to contact me about that, please head to the link in my show notes or on my website, casualcattleconversations.com. With that, let's visit with Allie. Hey folks, have I told you about my favorite app to manage all of the data for our cow herd? We made the switch to Breeder and it is saving us hours. From basic inventory management to calving records, treatments, reminders, weights, running reports, and exploring different marketing avenues for your calves, Breeder has you covered. One of the best parts is they also work with multiple supply chains to offer alternative marketing outlets for your cattle. We can then choose to get carcass data back on our calves to help us make informed breeding choices for the next year. To learn more, head to their website, breeder.co. That's B-R-E-E-D-R dot C-O. And the link is in the show notes. So we decided that we wanted to um, serve our community. And by doing that, we up-leveled our, our genetic potential. So we wanted to ensure that we were bringing in um, the best efficiency possible for our side of the business to make sure that we are doing our part um, turning in a good profit for what we are doing because the longer our cattle are on the land, the you know less money you make. And so um, really diving into genetics and really kind of geeking out over genetics became a number one priority for us, as well as uh, marbling genetics, tenderness scores, um, even like longevity purposes for like maternal traits, making sure that our herd stays functional for as long as possible, like feet and udders and all that kind of stuff, maternal traits. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what started our operation and what we kind of are all about today is just making sure that we can bring the best beef possible to San Diego County and beyond hopefully one day, um, with what we have. So, um, so yeah, we're very thankful for where we are and how we got started and where we are today. Do you feel like your location in San Diego County helped or hurt you more as you were getting started? Honestly, I feel like it helps. Um, I feel like it helps because people, especially now after COVID happened and everything, people really want to know where their food comes from and they really want to know the face behind agriculture. So um, when we first started, I started kind of diving into social media a little bit and that kind of exposed who we were as ranchers, that we we're kind of like a historical ranch in the county. And people really wanted to learn more about us, about our family and about our beef. And that kind of like led into a way that I can advocate for the beef industry on both, um, you know, the meat side and the cattle side. And that has helped us tremendously in business too. So I would say like 98% of our audience is really excited to know us, excited to learn from us, um, even being from the beach and never seeing a cow in real life before, but they can kind of live through that through social media. So that has helped a lot. Um, you know, you always get some uh, hate online or people that just don't understand and will never understand and you really can't change their minds and, you know, vice versa. So you kind of have to let those things slide and not let it bother you. Um, but in general, I would say like we have a pretty strong um, community of people that really just want to know where their food comes from. So we're happy to, you know, 
invite people to come and see our ranch. We do, we've done ranch dinners here where people can um, learn more about the cattle side and the beef side and really where their food comes from. Well, awesome. And I appreciate what you said about, you know, you'll get comments online, but you can't change their mind. And you're right. We can't change anyone's mind. It's ultimately up to our individual selves or their individual selves to change their mind, but we can present the truth and share stories. So I appreciate you saying that. Now talk a little bit about, you know, you said you started with those 10 heifers you were gifted and you have a background in the beef industry and dairy industry the you know, cattle run deep in your genetics. What else does Flying F offer now outside? Because you started with those 10, where are you at today? Yeah. So we started with those 10. Um, we actually sold a lot of those cows to a really close friend of ours just down the road. So there's still, I can still kind of see them off the side of the road here and there, but we did end up buying, um, 10 new heifers. Some of them were bred, some of them were not, um, back in 2021. And we bought a few bulls since then. So, um, things have transformed into more of a black Angus, um, influenced herd. And we do have a few of our original girls around. So, and we kept them because they were good mothers. So we wanted to make sure that we were, um, giving them the best potential possible by AIing them with good genetics that we want to keep around and also, um, buying bulls that are going to, um, complement them well. So, um, we kind of diversified in the more, uh, registered black Angus side. Uh, my family has never, ever done anything, uh, purebred before. It's always been a mixed herd of all kinds of things. Like we still have some dairy influence on my dad's property. Um, some Hereford, some Simmental, some limousine, some, some Angus, it's kind of like a mix, um, which is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but my husband and I really appreciate the, the data collection and the numbers that the Black Angus Association among all the other, um, purebred associations that are available to ranchers right now. So, um, that's something that has diverse, diversified us a little bit. Additionally, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that we are able to offer um, more experiences for our community by doing dinners. Uh, We're going to be doing some picnics on the ranch. Um, I want people to come and like actually feed the cows and ask the questions and, you know, see the baby calves running around because, you know, like I feel like a lot of people imagine a feedlot kind of situation, like what we essentially run. We basically run a mini feedlot on our ranch. So we feed a grain finished diet to our cattle, but I want to show people like what we actually truly do. Like they're not just stuck in tiny little pens and, um, you know, being like force fed grain, like they love their grain and they're on some pasture and they have access to fresh water and they're, they have access to fresh sunshine and we're watching them every day. So I want to make sure that we're showing like exactly what we do. Cause I want to ensure that we have that trust that essentially what everybody really wants it within their food and in their end product when they're feeding their families. So um, we want to do more experiences and things like that. I'm working on that right now. Um, we did have our first farm dinner on the ranch in October and it was amazing, but it was freezing. And it was like the one cold day of the that week. So we kind of improvised and had like a little bonfire. We had a Santa Maria grill. So people were kind of like standing around, kind of watching the chefs cook while also staying warm. And um, I had my one of my good friends next door has a flower field. So she brought her flowers and it was like a really cool collaboration kind of event. Um, I had another friend come and um, donate her event tables and things like that. So it turned out amazing and I can't wait to do more of that. But we wanted to kind of get through the winter and the spring because our spring can be a little shaky sometimes with the weather with rain and things like that we've even had snow in the past couple of weeks so it's been like really unpredictable um so this summer I'm really excited to start doing a little bit more of a like experience kind of farm to table sort of events to make sure that we are you know continuing to tell our story and also um get beef into the mouths and bellies of people in our community you certainly do a lot and that uh, advocate of the year award was very well deserving for you now what really drove your decision to diversify from just selling direct to consumer and to add on you know these farm to table events well when starting a business I think it's important to really think outside the box because if you don't do that you're not going to be making a whole lot of money 
Um, so essentially it's, it's a business kind of, um, mindset to make sure that you're doing everything possible to increase that end profit for yourself for the year. Um, and also just like watching my family throughout the years doing the same thing. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this is like, we've always done it that we've always done it this way, or grandpa always did it this way. So we're going to follow what grandpa always did. And I've always been a little bit more of a, a risky type of person, uh, somebody who likes to push the envelope a little bit and kind of like experiment. I'm creative. Um, I like to think that I can be a good people person. So using all those kind of different traits, I think is something that, um, you know, every good business person should have. And at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to, you know, create the best experience possible for our customers. And by doing that, like it's going to be doing little funky things that we've never done before, like farm to table dinners, like mm -hmm. that kind of stuff scares the bejesus out of my parents, you know, <laughs> but for somebody like me, this is something fun and exciting. And we're able to share a story even further with, with strangers that can take, you know, their experience home and share with their family and friends. Like, you won't believe like what I did this weekend, like just an hour outside of San Diego, I went to this ranch and we had a dinner on the ranch and it was beautiful. And I never knew San Diego was like that. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, being able to think outside the box, get creative, get gritty and kind of have a little bit of no shame because sometimes your plans don't work at all, <laughs> but sometimes they'll work really good and, um, you'd surprise yourself. So, um, I don't know. I think just having that kind of good go-getter attitude is helpful. And um, it's something that I think is needed, especially if you want to kind of like diversify your business and um, put more dollars in your pocket, as well as like bring the best experience possible to your, to your consumers and your customers. Thank you for talking through that. And I mean, I think that's so true, especially with what you guys are doing on a smaller scale compared to people who have 100, 200, 300 or more head of cattle. It's a different type of business. And I think right. both benefit from diversifying from a risk management standpoint, but it's just different when you look at the scale. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you said that because I think that's something that um, that's why we have to kind of push a little bit harder because we don't have a huge herd where other people do. So like their income could be easily done within a year or whatever, if they have like 150 to like 250 cattle to um, process every year to sell every year, but I don't have that. We have about like 25 head. So because we only have 25 head, it's important for us to think of other ways of how we can make this work because we don't want to go bankrupt doing this. Like this isn't like a hobby. I quit my, my job to do this, my real job. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I can do everything possible to be able to make this work. So I think it's important that you pointed that out too. Um, we are small scale. So if you're small, you kind of have to think a little bit harder about how you're going to make it happen. Do you have cool season pastures that you wish you could graze in the summer? Or maybe you graze corn stalks but wish that ground could provide a little extra nutrition. Or perhaps you watch your fallow wheat acres bake in the sun all summer, providing no additional income. For all these situations and more, at Green Cover, they've got the seed and expertise to get you covered. They listen to your needs to design a custom seed mix that works for your unique situation. They grow over 60% of their inventory through contract producers, and they deliver it right to your door, no matter where you are at in the country. With over 120 species in stock, from sorghum sedans, millets and cowpeas to oats, rye, clovers and peas, they have everything you need to keep your ground covered and feed your livestock. Reach out to their expert sales team to get a quote today or visit their website at greencover.com. What do you think one of the advantages to being small scale is? I mean, did you grow up on a small scale operation? So have you been a part of, have you always been small scale or have you been a part of like maybe a larger scale and a smaller scale? Um, so the family ranch was very large at one point. The, um, the whole ranch used to be like, I don't even know. It was a lot of the back country of San Diego County. If I were to guess, it was probably like at least 10,000 acres or so at one point in time, which is big for here because we're a lot of hilly area and things like that. And there's not, it's not a huge County. Um, but growing up, um, as I mentioned before, it was a dairy ranch. So we had all Holsteins and some Swiss brown Swiss cows. Uh, I want to say my grandpa had probably like 150 head of mm -hmm. dairy cattle. 
um, that they were milking twice a day, every day for forever. And then he had he decided to sell those cows in 1999 and he bought a ranch in New Mexico and uh, ran beef cattle there. And then that's when everything here transformed into a beef operation only. So um, it was about, I want to say also he had about 150 head or so, maybe 200 head of beef cattle at the time. So this is like late nineties into the two thousands. And then um, my grandpa passed away in 2010. And at that point, the ranch kind of split up into different um, properties because uh, it got split between four siblings. My dad got the main ranch where the main dairy was. So he runs about 130 head or so, um, give or take. So it's always been like, that's not huge, I guess, but it's like a fair amount for our area. Um, cause we're in Southern California. We're not like in Nebraska or somewhere like that, where there's like thousands ahead of cattle. So I would say it's pretty small scale, but I'm even smaller than that. Like just Bryce and I having our own herd. Um, but we're just across the street from my dad. So we do a lot of work together as a family. So it's been a lot of, um, you know, learning from both sides, I guess you could say. Do you think there are advantages to you being smaller? Like when you think about, you know, I mean, I guess anything. Yeah. Um, I think when you're smaller, you can take riskier decisions and also you're able to kind of, you know, walk through or almost like, um, what's the word, uh, like test things a little bit easier instead of like having like a big amount of cattle to, to process to add a meat processor or something like that. I can process like two or three and see how it works and see how the pricing works and things like that instead of like sending 10, you know what I mean? So, um, like we're actually in the process of, um, doing retail cuts of beef as well. So this is like something that we're on a smaller scale. So we're able to kind of like see how this works, you know, tweak things if we need to tweak pricing, if we need to, you know, kind of ask customers how they're enjoying the experience and things like that. So I think that's what's nice about being small is we're able to have a better relationship with our customers. We can have one-on-ones with them um, and we can essentially like really nail down our end product for everybody at the end of the day. So um, I would say that's what I think is nice about it. And then hopefully in the future, we can start to scale slowly. And um, like, for example, we're gonna be buying some cattle from my dad that we put some of our black Angus bulls on his herd. So we know that the genetics are good and we'll select, you know, whichever um, steers and heifers that we think are going to be suitable for our beef program and be able to scale from there. So we're working our way up. So I think it's nice to start small so you can kind of scale slowly and make sure that you're taking all the right precautions and steps to get to where you want to be. Or when you say your beef program now, is that, is everything, does all the beef get sold locally or do you ship nationally? We don't ship nationally. Um, That's always been like a hot topic between my husband and I, because we don't feel like we really need to just because we are in San Diego County. It's a lot of people not that far away from us. So um, like, for example, I just put our wholesale beef. So just holes and halves of beef for sale online a couple of weeks ago, and it sold in four hours and that's just local, you know? So we don't really need to, like, it's not like I live in the middle of Kansas and need to ship it out because I don't have the community right there. Um, so that's very nice for us. And we're, um, you know, very thankful that we have a community of people that really want our product. So we don't need to ship. I don't think I really want to ship because I do want to focus on the local side of things. And, um, honestly, it's going to be easier for us too. I don't have to, um, do that, but we'll see. I'm not sure like things could change. I can totally see myself shipping to friends and family that live in like Montana or elsewhere in the country and things like that. And then if that does well, then awesome. But um, also I think it's going to be fun to be able to serve our community, especially when we do get our retail beef in. And um, our plan is to start doing beef boxes to start and then sell at one of our friends antique shops in town. So just have like a freezer space and people can pick up their orders um, whenever they make their order or whatnot. So, um, so yeah, I think we don't really need a ship yet, but right now we're still kind of working out the kinks and stuff. Cause we haven't even processed our USDA retail cut beef yet, but it's all hopefully coming together soon. 
That's exciting though. And I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, I was just curious about how you handled that or if you needed to ship, because some people say I've heard, I think it was even just last week I was on a phone call with someone and they're like, well, if you're not shipping beef, you're not going to make it. And I was like, well, I feel like that really depends on the individual business. So I appreciate your perspective. Yeah, I definitely think it depends on location and availability and what your customer base is. So for us, it's easy. It's not, we don't have to work too hard to be able to find those customers because they're right there. But like I said, again, like if you live in um, somewhere that is a little bit more um, hard to get those customers, then yeah, I can see that being very, you know, that's going to be your main driving factor for your your meat sales is to ship. Um, But, you know, everybody's different. And I think, again, we're totally learning. So this is going to be a first thing for us and hopefully cross our fingers. It all works out great. But, um, but yeah, it's going to be an exciting and a lot of learning curves. I'm sure I can foresee in the future. (laughs) So what is your favorite part about working in the beef industry? Um, it might sound cliche, but I love telling our story. And I love talking to people that have no experience within the industry at all. Um, And I know you mentioned Beef Advocate of the Year, and that is like a huge honor for me. And that was um, that was a big surprise. And I am like so thankful for that. But it's something that I truly love to do is to tell our story as um, just our family and then as well as our story as a nation for the cattle industry, because we we grow the best beef in the world, hands down. And it's all thanks to like innovative practices, genetics, um, feed programs, and just all the things. Our veterinarians, everybody is working so hard to make sure that we are providing the best end product possible. And it's something that really needs to be shared. And I know that we get a lot of backlash from big organizations like PETA and DXE and all these crazy animal rights people and just sharing the wrong information essentially and trying to use fear tactics to scare people away from eating any sort of meat as any sort of meat um, that is available to them. So I feel like it's a duty for me and I'm the type of person that I stand up for the little guys and I want to make sure that I'm honoring like my heritage and like the truth essentially. So I think, um, yeah, for me, I just want to make sure that I'm sharing our story. And I love having those communications with people that have no idea. And like, you know, they like light bulbs go off all the time when I'm speaking with people and they're like, wow, I didn't know that. That's, that's interesting. Like, I'm going to take that home to my family and I want to buy your beef. And so it kind of like works full circle for me when I, you know, speak about it in that kind of way. And also like trying to tie it back to that person too, you know, like I'm a mother. So I like to make, um, conversation with other mothers about like the benefits of beef for feeding your family and all the like different like tactics you can use with in in the kitchen when it comes to providing beef for your family and you know all the nutritional value things like that I love having conversations with moms and um you know about like shopping in the grocery store like little things like that so yeah that's what I enjoy the most about it I would say awesome well kind of a As we work towards the end of our conversation here, what's a pasture hill you're willing to die on? So what's that hill you're willing to die on, but put a beef industry twist on it? Okay. Um, A hill I'm willing to die on is California is an amazing state. And I always get a lot of flack on this online. And, um, you know, everybody loves to hate California. And I am a diehard California lover for life. And I think a lot of people view California as LA or San Francisco, and that's all they see. But California has so much rich agriculture here. We have over 400 commodities that we um, grow and produce and ship out to the nation as well as the entire world. We're like number five in the um, economy. I could be wrong on this, but we're like number five in the world for um, agriculture. So I will die on the hill that California is just a really amazing state and people need to come and visit us and see what we're all about because there's a lot of good people here. A lot of people here are very down to earth and everything you see online and everything you see on the news is a bunch of baloney in my opinion. And um, there's like 2% of that and the rest of the state is a lot of really awesome people. So I will die on that hill because 
the ranching community and the cattle community in California is top notch too. All right, Allie. Well, do you have any other final thoughts before we wrap up today? Um, eat beef. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks, Shay. This was fun. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you, Allie, for being a part of this conversation. And thank you to everyone who listened. If you want to learn more about Allie, I included the link to her website in my show notes. And remember the best way to support podcasts, whether it's my podcast or even go listen to Allie's podcast as well, is to give a rating and review and even better yet, share it with a friend. With that, have a great day and happy ranching, folks.